Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so I would like to, to address today the uh, spin mechanics of ferromagnets, which means the coupling between uh, the ferromagnetic order parameter with the lattice with the phonons. Um, this is uh, the overview. And I would like to start with, uh, with some uh, elementary introduction for those who are not familiar with the subject. Um, first would be the classical uh, Einstein, de Haas and Barnett effects. Um, it's also called, this is also called Einstein's only experiment. Uh, it consisted of a suspended ferromagnetic bar, uh, which is subject to a uh, uh, varying magnetic field. So if it is magnetized in this way, uh, and we apply a magnetic field in the opposite direction, we will change the polarization of the ferromagnet. And Einstein and de Haas observed that uh, there is a torque uh, on this magnet and it will start to rotate. Now the magnetization is basically a, a mechanical angular momentum. So we can understand this experiment simply uh, with this flywheel analogy. This guy here on a rotatable chair has his flywheel and if he rotates the flywheel then uh, conservation of angular momentum forces the, uh, the rotating chair uh, to, to rotate. Right? Now the analogous uh, uh, experiment uh, or, or similar experiment was carried out by Barnett around the same time. Uh, and this can be best explained by the simple apparatus, which is uh, the full analogy of the effect. So what you see here is, uh, is this construction uh, here, this uh, bar A, uh, and on this pivot point it's free to rotate. Now in this uh, bar, in this A, there is a uh, gyroscope built in, which is rapidly rotating, which corresponds to an angular momentum L0. Now uh, we can rotate the whole thing, uh, like this uh, arrows here, right? Rotate the whole thing uh, with a rotational frequency omega, just generate an addition additional angular momentum L prime. So what is happening? Um, so we have this L0, the original one, which when it's parallel and we add an L prime. Now, the angular momentum must be uh, preserved, but uh, angular momentum can be transferred between uh, this, this whole apparatus and this gyroscope. And actually, if L0 goes to L, and at the same time L prime vanishes, so the apparatus starts to stop, then we can reduce the energy of the system. So this means that this springs S will be elongated. Now, if this uh, gyroscope is actually a magnet or, or some charged rotation, uh, which has a gyros, uh, gyromagnetic uh, ratio gamma, then uh, this effect, this rotation is completely equivalent to a uh, Barnett field, which is proportional to this rotating frequency, so this rotation. So this omega, the absolute value is just phi dot. So this magnetic field then wants to align the magnetization to the rotation axis. <coughs> so if you rotate a, a demagnetized ferromagnet, then this rotation will generate a magnetic field and will polarize the magnet. And that's what Barnett measured. Okay, so we can look at the simple model system and go to the nanoscale and see what the effects are of these two effects. Now what we have here is a freely, rotating, uh, freely suspended magnetic wire <coughs> and it may have a domain wall inside. Now the equations, classical equations, are very simple. You have the LLG equation uh, where alpha, the damping, is an important parameter. And we have here the, the uh, Barnett field proportional to the rotational angle uh, of this wire phi dot, the velocity. Now we also assume that this rod is, is rigid and the Newton's equation just look like that. And we have here the uh, uh, Einstein de Haas talks we should take into account. <coughs> now we can calculate these equations easy if we go to the uh, collective coordinate method where this whole magnetization is parametrized just by the position of this domain wall. So, how can we excite such a system? Uh, we can do this uh, with a magnetic field or we can do this with a mechanical torque which rotates the wire. 
The response of the system is the velocity of this moving domain wall under these two forces or the uh, rotational velocity, the, magnetic, uh, the, the mechanical velocity of this wire. Um, now we can then do linear response to the system and so these are the driving forces, uh, here are the responses and we know, we heard it already, we have Unzaga's reciprocity theorem we know that these two uh, response uh, coefficients must be identical. Actually, one corresponds to Einstein de Haas and the other corresponds to the Barnett effect. And in linear response, these two are basically uh, two sides of the same metal. And of course, we can also calculate them for this, uh, for this uh, simple model here. The point I would like to make is that if you do any calculations, you should take into account both the uh, Barnett and the uh, Einstein de Haas effect at the same time. Good. Now, these two effects are still uh, subject to uh, very recent research. Uh, what you see here, these are uh, experiments uh, uh, by Professor Seite and collaborators who really show that there is a Barnett effect on uh, nuclear magnetic resonance uh, in rapidly rotating samples. Uh, now here, this is uh, an experiment from uh, Professor Bernstofer, a very recent one, where he showed that if you have uh, a, uh, a molecular magnet uh, attached to a, a uh, carbon uh, nanotube here, suspended carbon nanotube, then the Einstein de Haas effect is active in suppressing quantum tunneling of spin in these molecules. So I think uh, these modern electromicroscopes are really amazing. Look this resolution power here. <laughs> okay, another elementary effect is the magnetoelastic coupling. Now, of course, magnetoelasticity is a very classical effect. It uh, causes, for example, magnetostriction. Right, so we have something like magnetic anisotropy, which couples indeed the spin and the lattice. So if you deform the lattice, the magnetization will minimize its energy and go into the same direction. Now that is statics, but there's of course also dynamics, and the dynamics causes important effects like the thermalizations between lattice and spin, magnon phonon drift effects, but it also call, call generates hybridized states between the magnons and the phonons when they are coherently coupled. Now this, uh, uh, this uh, is of course has a long time ago been already discussed by Kittel uh, and uh, also picked up more recently. But the problem, at least in linear response, is again just coupled harmonic oscillators which are distributed. Now in this picture here you see uh, uh, the magnon dispersion which is basically flat on this scale and we have the longitudinal and the transverse acoustic phonon modes. Now, if you look more precisely, then you see that this coupling I was talking about indeed gives an anti-crossing between these two modes, and uh, the size of this is proportional to the magnetoelastic coupling constant. Now, magnon polaritons are the, uh, the mixed state between photons and magnons, so we call these excited, these hybridized state, not magnon polaritons, but magnon polaron. Okay, so that was the introduction, and let's come to the first topic of, of, of new results. And uh, there is a poster by Hedje Keschka and Simon Streib. Uh, Hedje was not able to get a visa, but uh, Simon, is, Simon is here. So please uh, visit his poster to learn more about this. i just give some brief summary. So the problem we have to calculate, uh, we, are, we are looking at, is a magnetic nanoparticle which is suspended, it can be an aerosol or, or, or in other way suspended. Um, and we want to calculate the dynamics uh, without any internal degrees of freedom. So they are so small that uh, the magnon and the phonon modes are frozen out. So we have the macro spin and the mac mac macro lattice approximation. Now then we have uh, these coupled equations to solve uh, where the Einstein de Haas effect gives here the mechanical torque uh, in relation to the magnetization dynamics. And we have to uh, uh, take into account the Barnett effect in the LLG equation, which gives you this extra term here. And omega is again the rotational frequency. Um, usually, this effect is only taken into account for rapidly rotating particles. 
but that is actually not necessary. You have also these effects in precessing particles. The only difference is that in that case, omega is time dependent. Okay, anyway, this can all be solved. And these are the solutions uh, in the linear response regime to an AC magnetic field uh, carried out by, by, by Simon. Uh, these results here is for an iron sphere. Uh, and so we apply a magnetic field, a DC and an AC magnetic field. So the magnetization is in, in the normal direction and uh, in equilibrium, uh, the anisotropy axis is in the same direction. If you calculate the fMR, then you see uh, here at, at the normal fMR frequency, you observe that the coupling, this is Einstein, de Haas and, and, and the damping, uh, gives you a shift of the fMR, a blue shift, uh, which is not so big. Um, the quality factor of this fMR line is just one divided by twice the Gilbert damping constant, which is 50 for iron, typically. Now, the interesting thing is that at low frequencies, you find that there are satellites. Uh, and these satellites turn out to be very, very sharp. Uh, so this corresponds basically to an uh, alpha, to a damping constant, which is the same, basically, as of YIG. Right? So made out of a very bad magnet, uh, damping is bad, you made a good magnet. So this should be very interesting. If you can put this into microwave cavity with, with, with the sharp, sharp mode definition, it's very easy to go into a nonlinear chaotic regime and possibly also into the quantum regime. Now, uh, these spectra, they also depend on the shape. Uh, if we take a pancake, for example, it turns out that there's only one satellite instead of two. So you can also get information about the shape of the nanoparticles by these type of experiments. Next, I would like to, uh, to, to discuss this hybrid particle, this magnon polaron. And you can observe it actually in different experiments. And first, let's address optical experiments. Um, now, there's a new technique, which is really quite recent, which is a spatiotemporally resolved femtosecond uh, pump probe spectroscopy. So what the experimentalists do, they have a focused laser, focused to less than a micron, uh, which hits a magnetic film. So it's like throwing a stone into the water and then see the ripples which are expanding from, from, from the origin. Uh, so this is the pump and the probe looks basically at the uh, magneto-optical Kerr effect and it resolves the Z component of the magnetization, which at equilibrium is in the plane. Now this is a nice picture of, uh, of, of, of the Ogawa paper. Uh, so here this is the origin, which it was excited. And this is, uh, is a snapshot taken a few nanoseconds after the excitation. And you see some concentric rings which go outside. So what is it? What is this? Now, Kashen from Delft has calculated this problem. Uh, so it's basically, it's again, it's a coupled set of uh, differential equations. And you can solve this as a function of time and a function of space. And here are the results compared to the experiments by Oga Weidal. So we have two time shots. This is 3.4 and 6.2 nanoseconds. So what do we see? Now, first of all, we see that the things expands as we would expect, right? Uh, we see two type of rings with different symmetry, right? This one here has a mirror symmetry and this one has a fourfold symmetry. Now we can look at the velocity which these rings uh, expand. So, and we see that after 6.2 nanoseconds, this inner ring uh, agrees very well with the uh, transverse uh, with the velocity of the transverse acoustic phonon. Whereas this outer one is, agrees with the faster pressure waves, the longitudinal acoustic phonon. Now this is a spin information which now turns out to move with the velocity of the phonons. And actually magnons are extremely slow. If you look at this, if it would be purely magnon, the delta function at the origin probably wouldn't have moved at all. So what we see here is 
spin information, which is, uh, which is piggyback on the phonons, which are expanding and transported in this lattice. So what is the temperature here? Uh, that is room temperature, yes. So this, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so we see that, that the spin information is really carried by the phonons, or to be more precise, by this mixture, this uh, magnon polaron, this hybridized state between magnons and phonons. Yeah, Clary, since magnons are not slow, they are faster than the sound velocity. Yeah, but <laughs> the only problem is a big ratio between the phase and the group velocity, but so the mode is just doing this one here if you, if you make a move. No, no, I think if, if, if you look at the, uh, the ones without dipolar interaction, we are rather oh, a little bit high. Modes. Yes, these are the exchange modes. They are, they are practically, yeah, yes. Right. Uh, right, so now we've seen it in optics. Can we also see this in transport? Uh, and the experiment uh, uh, which is suited to do that is the spin Seebeck effect. So I hope that most of you know what it is all about. Uh, it uh, usually consists of a temperature gradient which is applied to a magnetic insulator like YIG. Uh, and this generates uh, a, a spin current which can be detected by a metallic contact which has a uh, uh, yeah, large, rather large inverse spin hole effect and then generates a transverse voltage. And here are the original experiments where you really see that this uh, delta T uh, and the thermal and, and, and the voltage, they scale uh, nicely linear. And this is indeed the spin Seebeck effect. Now it started by, by, by these data, which were shown by, uh, uh, by Professor Saito, namely that the spin Seebeck effect, shown here as a function of magnetic field, has these little peaks which turn out to be uh, completely reproducible. It's not noise, it's not really glitches, it's something that's reproducible, it's always there. Uh, and we see there are even two of them. Now we thought we can explain that. And yeah, uh, and in order to do that, I asked, uh, so we got, yeah, the actual calculations were done by Beta Flebus and Ka Shen. Uh, Beta did the uh, analytics and Ka did the numerics. It was a beautiful collaboration. Yeah, what's the insert? The insert, insert, or why is it sharper in the insert? Uh, the temperature? Yeah, it's just, no, it's just the, the action. Just, just the zoom. Same temperature. Magnification around the peaks. So this is the same thing here. Yes, and the same thing, and okay. just cut it here. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we are now in a, in a, in a sort of, yeah, uh, we expand this picture of the dispersions a little bit. Uh, here again, the transverse phonons, LR phonons. Um, and we see now that the magnon is, is, is parabolic. Um, so, of course, in, in the real calculations, we have to take into account the dipolar corrections. But, but this is just for a sketch. So what we see here is we have this crossings here at low frequency. That's the one we have sawn, uh, seen in the optics experiment, but there are also other crossings here at, at, uh, at higher wave numbers and at higher frequencies. We also see that there is magnetostatic coupling here uh, in, 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 these, in these states. So what is the effect on transport? <clears throat> First of all, we have to take into account that we are at finite temperatures, so we need that we need occupation of these states. If there are no magnons, we, we don't see any spin Seebeck effect. So we should consider what the distribution function equilibrium is. Uh, and I think it's quite obvious that if we would be at low temperatures with a distribution function like that, uh, we would not occupy this state, for example. So we need temperature is clearly, also the, the average temperature is clearly an important parameter here. Now, uh, there would be equilibrium, uh, but we would like to have, of course, the non-equilibrium transport, the response of the system to a temperature gradient. And, of course, uh, we know in principle at least how to do it because there is something like the uh, Boltzmann equation. <coughs> now, while this can be written down easily, to work it out is, of course, a little bit more complicated, and that has been done by, uh, by Benedetta and by Ka. So here are the results. Um, actually, it turns out that yeah, most of the parameters of the Boltzmann equation there are already known from experiments uh, in the Groningen group and, and, and others. Um, 
but there is still one important parameter, which is the scattering of the phonons respect in relative to the magnons. This is basically a completely unknown parameter. Now, what you then do is, yeah, to you introduce simply a, a parameter, and parameter eta, uh, which is the ratio of the scattering uh, potentials of the magnons and the phonons. This is a parameter. Now, it turns out that this parameter, if you choose the value, if this one here is 100, you get the best agreement with experiments. Now, here's, here's the result. Uh, so here's uh, basically the spin Zebeck coefficient. And we see that uh, we have these peaks here. Uh, if this ratio is 10, uh, if this ratio is, is 1, if the scattering is the same, we don't see anything. Now, this is again just an expanded uh, picture of it. So what is happening here? Now, clearly, if we mix magnons and phonons and the phonons are much more mobile than the magnons, then somehow this should improve the transport, right? Uh, but this crossing in the total of case space which contributes to transport is pretty small. And this, the peaks are small. So when is it becoming important? And there, phase space turns out to be important. For example, if we have a crossing here between the magnons and the phonons, right, uh, and this crossing is rather steep, then this area in reciprocal space where this mixing is important is small. However, if the phonons actually touch the magnons, right, then this k-space regime where this mixing is important becomes much larger. So we can expect that uh, this mixing or this magnon polaron effect should be maximized exactly when the phonons, which are the acoustic, uh, the, the longitudinal or the transverse ones, touch the magnons. And we have these two phonon branches, so we can expect also two of these maxima, two peaks in, in this spin Zebeck effect. And uh, we can compare the results here for different temperatures and for these different uh, crossings or anti-crossings. And we see a beautiful agreement between theory and experiment. Right? Okay. And, uh, yeah. Of course, I should say, yeah, maybe I should just edit here, huh? but what, what we are doing in order to get this touching is to simply apply a magnetic field, because then we are shifting the magnon relative rigidly to the, uh, to the phonons, right? And at different magnetic fields, we get this touching condition. Okay. Right. <coughs> now, um, that was it what I had to tell today. These are the take-home messages. Uh, so. The fMR of magnetic nanoparticles uh, should give new information uh, uh, and they can be generated to have they're really basically <coughs> little motors which can be driven by AC uh, uh, microwaves uh, and can be driven probably into the, uh, into the chaotic or quantum regime. Spin transport in YIG uh, can be dominated by phonons and magnon polon anom anom anomaly uh, gives you new information, namely the ratio of the scattering between magnons and phonons. And it turns out that the acoustic quality of YIG is better than the magnetic one, which is quite surprising. Uh, yes, I would like to thank my collaborators. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Actually, you still have three minutes left. Oh, so I have discussion left. No, no, it's 13 minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> okay, questions, uh, yeah. Very, yes, the, to the last point. So you use basically the phonons to transport magnetic information. Yes. And you discussed the touching points. And I had it in the last hour work on each is last hour. And I thought a little bit about it. You probably have an additional effect, which might move it away from the exact touching point. And that is for the transport, you need, first of all, transport magnetic volume of some kind. That is a touching argument, a phase space argument. And the second is you need to have group velocity. Of course, if you have hybridization, locally you always find areas in the hybridization between where the group velocity is enhanced, which might also add to this effect. But that is not yet, is it a second order effect only, or is it something which will substantially 
valid here. Now the calculations, they take this fully into account. So this phase space argument is hand waving. Yeah. So that's that's what I think is something which which we see and uh, which also agrees uh, with experiments because indeed these maxima, uh, at least within the accuracy of the parameters, always agree nicely with this touching uh, condition. So it it could be that the magnitude uh, is is affected by that definitely. So that's why you need still a calculation. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, since we are on the topic, Ma, before I'm asking my question, I would like to uh, come back to that argument. So group velocity is only enhanced because if you have crossing between two quasi particles and one of them has a higher group velocity than the other, yeah. then the, the net group velocity of the, the other doesn't one, count. You don't, you the don't the net the group one. velocity is half of the two, and that's why you see an enhancement. <laughs> and which brings me to the question, yes, could you go to Carl's work, the slide where you show the spatio-temporal after laser? Yeah. So here my question is, I, I would I would guess that magnetic polarons is not guess actually calculated. Uh, magnetic polarons have half of the velocity of the sound because for the low energy magnetic polarons, the magnons are flat between zero group velocity, acoustic modes are uh, at their own group velocity, and the magnetic polarons are at exactly the half. So my question is because you say here the group velocity of these modes is exactly the same as sound. So that is unsettling for me. Is it possible that a factor of two would get lost in some way, or maybe I'm mistaken there? Um, <coughs> I think uh, we have to be a little bit careful with, uh, uh, with, with this here, because um, this material is really pretty, uh, has large alpha, alpha 0.1 or so. Um, so that means we are not really in a strong coupling regime here. Okay. Uh, so that means uh, I think this argument of the group velocity does not really work. So I guess what we really have here, we have uh, sort of the activated, activated transport uh, just close to this crossing, mm -hmm. and it has two components. And what you see is only the fast component. Yep. Such question about this influence of uh, phonons, longitudinal and transversal phonons, and spin their back. Yes. It looks like that influence is pretty similar. Yeah, if you look on these uh, small peculiarities on the top of the uh, yeah? Right, let's see. Maybe um, let's look on the previous, uh, previous, previous slide. slide. Previous slide. Uh, yeah. So this one is the, the transverse one. Yeah. That means this is at rather low magnetic fields. So you get this touching condition. This one here, you need the high temperature, yeah. right? This is the, uh, the high magnetic yeah. field. So shift this up, yes? It looks very reasonable, but only once it is principally known that longitudinal phonons interact with magnets with very small efficiency. No, no. Transversal one, uh, right polarized transversal no, no, I think you, I, you have to be... Very good and this is no, 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 no. You can see this also here. Uh, you see, these ones here, are the, sl the slow ones are the transversal ones. So you see, if you go into the symmetry direction here, then uh, this one is strong, but there is no coupling at all to the longitudinal, longitudinal. one. <laughs> However, if you go in a non-symmetry direction, uh, you see this one is much stronger than this one. So this is the point, this is also why things has to be done numerically, because it's, 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 it's all, uh, it's anisotropic. You really have to integrate over, over, over the whole case space. So, yeah. 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 Just to understand what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, you, um, you're saying that this is due to the hybridization. Uh, like this, uh, care so the, the signal that you look at is uh, a yes. characterization. It's a curve. So you only see it near the hybridization points, like away from the hybridization points, like the signal goes away experimentally? <laughs> yes. If you, for example, you can test this by the size of the excitation spot. If you make the spot uh, not very focused, you only sample k values which are close to gamma, and then the signal goes away. Then, then you don't see this. You really have to need focused, very focused ones in order to reach. In, in yes. the magnetic material, the phonons yes. themselves, you know, would have would carry some angle of momentum and could give rise to some uh, signal. 
Yes, so you, you, you might also say, okay, we have the magnetic system, right? And uh, uh, sort of we have a pure phononic package we are exciting, which is expanding. Uh, and locally, uh, sort of, yeah, if, 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 if it's in the rate right k omega, it excites the magnetization. Oh, but I, mean, I, I, I think that that, that is sort of a, that would be a better way than you. Then I think also that would be a good answer to to Akers as well, right? I mean, even if I'm away, you know, I'm saying is that <coughs> away from this crossing points, I would still expect some signal. Yeah, but that is the directly. Yeah, but then I think the 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 interaction with the with the magnons is strongest when when they are degenerate. Well, I don't in think I need magnons to to see an effect. Like a phonon wave packet itself carries an uh, angular momentum. It, it should yeah, but you don't you don't see that with the uh, curve rotation. In curve rotation, you only see the magnetization. No, you see you should see everything, right? I no, mean, uh, I don't think so. Why wouldn't you see? I mean, it's you then then, then you would. Right you know, then it, it's an it's an angular momentum. Any angular momentum, you should be able to see with curve rotation. Uh, I think one have to look at the at the at the uh, cross sections. Uh, you want to say something? Yeah, I mean, so why, why do you think it? So you have a good I argument why it should have a small cross section. One has, to, one has to be very careful. You can also see the phonons. It simply depends on the relative orientation of the polarizer, the analyzer. The yeah. Okay. You can also see the phonons, right? Yes. 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 There's a good explanation why you see longitudinal phonons and why the group velocity is exactly what is calculated for phonons but not smaller. That is why if we hear the direct observation of phonons in this experiment, not magnets, but only phonons, could be. In such case, group velocity should be exactly the same as phonons, and uh, longitudinal phonons also should be very visible. Yeah, I think it's, as I said, the splitting is actually very small. Yeah, so yeah. you could also say, okay, let's do it in perturbation theory, right? And see that the only excite, the phonons, which you excite, no, no, the heat. But the phone, yes. the, the longitudinal and the transverse phonons have a linear dispersion. Yes. So in these kind of experiments, yeah, they all have the same group velocity. I mean, I mean, the, the, the transverse acoustic have the same, That's and the longitudinal yes. acoustic yes. Yes. have the same. So yes. they all superimpose on these kind, this kind of picture. So if the experiment and always in these experiments you have some leakage, because the signal from the phonons is about a factor of 10 to 100 stronger than the magnets if you have SS or PP polarization. So this means if you have SP polarization, which probably these people have used to see the magnetic excitation, there's still some leakage from the phonons, and that is simply what might have taken place here. So that means you would see it without magnet as well? Yep. So, yep. so what, indeed, these calculations, they only calculate, this is only the Z component of, of the magnetization, right? And this yeah, follows, this is, this is more or less a, a, a direct, <laughs> pardon me? What? I'm talking about the experiment, <laughs> <laughs> and there are to compare your calculations. No, no, but but uh, but you see exactly the same features here, right? Well, there's symmetry, yeah. right? That is symmetry, yes. Given by the symmetry of the material. Yes, because I think you can hybridize these these magnons and phonons only because they have the same symmetry, right? Otherwise, you would not be able to hybridize them from the outset. So the the question is whether, yeah, the 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 the, the matrix elements, the optical matrix elements. So I assume here that indeed. Uh, it is selective to the magnetic order. My point, my point is simply, the way you calculate it, you pick a specific point in the dispersion of the phonons because you have a mixture of the magnets due to hybridization. No, no, I think this, we, we take, this is about, this is all, all phonons and all magnons. Yes. This is a, this is an sort of, this, 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 these two equations, right, the, the magnetoelastic equations are solved exactly. And okay. this is the result. But, well, but the plot here only is the magnetic component. It's not the phononic component. In the but theory, that's fine. <laughs> but, but I still don't know why you don't see any, any as a theory and no, no dipolar contributions. No, no, dipolar is also, this is also included. This is, this is, this is included. This is the, 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 the full dispersion is included uh, of the backward moving volume modes here in these calculations. What is not included here are the Damon-Eschbach modes, assuming that that. Uh 
this is depends on the geometry of the field. Yes. Actually, well, we can discuss later. What about the temperature dependence? Wouldn't the temperature dependence be different if it's pure phonon compared to your phonon? It should not be because uh, the theory uh, here is also basically uh, uh, zero temperature. Because the excitation here is it's. Yeah, the temperatures are plotted. No, that was the spin Seebeck effect. This is different. So these are two different experiments. Ah. Here the excitation is, is really a strong excitation, very strong excitation, exactly at the origin. And this corresponds to 1000 Kelvin. I don't know. It's, it's so in, in this respect, this is the most important uh, perturbation. Uh, and this is the response. So I would expect that this is not very sensitive to temperature. Although I must say there are, I don't haven't seen any experiments at low temperature. No. But as a function of magnetic field, right? Like you, in the other as a function, yes. Yes, I, had, I have not the plots here, uh, but you can indeed, if you, if you indeed increase the magnetic field, you can uh, sort of uh, change the K value of the crossing, and you can sort of pull it out of the excitation regime, and you see that the signal goes down dramatically. But can you like, uh, as you crossing over, can the signal can go, go up and go down, like in the spin Zebek? No, no, it's, oh. it's, it's, it's a Gaussian distribution, basically, you excite. So you're either oh, in yeah. or out. Okay. So with increasing magnetic field, the signal so simply the goes down. So the magnetic field dependence is yeah. systematically yeah. consistent with yes. the field. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. I have another question about the Boltzmann equation. When you write down the Boltzmann equation, you have this relaxation time, which is momentum dependent. Yes. Yes, it's, it's just relaxation time, it's a constant. But if it has yes. a strong momentum dependence, it actually might change your results. Yeah, but okay, but you have to make some, 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 some assumption. So what we assume here is that there are magnetic scatterers, short range, and there are phononic scatterers, which are short range. Oh. And if you have the mixed state, uh, then they feel either the one or the other depending on the mixed. Yeah, that, that, is, that is an approximation, but um, yeah, things look quite good, so why bother? Uh, yeah. uh, I have a question on the low frequency satellites in magnetic nanoparticles. Yes. What determines the frequency? Um, the, the frequency depends strongly on the, on the sort of the normal mode frequency of the mechanical precession. So it depends strongly on the mass. Uh, for example, and it also depends on the on the on the, on, on the coupling, the the uh, uh, anisotropy constant. If you want to ask the detailed parametric dependence, please go to Simon's uh, poster. So, so it's proportional to magnetoelastic coupling. To no, no, there is no magnetoelastic coupling in the uh, in the nanoparticles. So we, it's it's the macro spin. They're very very small. They are two nanometers thick. So we can forget about magnons there, right? They are all frozen out. Phonons also frozen out. They are just rigid, but there still is sort of still you can the magnetization can move relative to the anisotropy, and this gives you the coupling. Okay, so I think uh, that's also time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And, uh,